I'm just sitting here relaxing. Thank you. You doing yeah, well? Yeah, I think. Okay, so what's quite interesting is that, uh, and this is what's so nice about doing this kind of thing online, it would have been impossible, Peter, to have done this offline because you're sitting in Norway. Norway. Yeah, absolutely. South, and, south of Oslo. And I'm sitting in uh, South Africa, just north of Johannesburg. So, Just six months ago, we were lamenting the cruel halt in gatherings. Online can never be as effective, we howled. Were we wrong? Well, Peter Carruthers has been almost completely online reliant for the past two decades since losing his business in the 90s. It's paid handsome dividends for him. In the process, he's been teaching entrepreneurs to carve out a steady stream of recession-proof income. In this webinar, Peter will share some of his tried and tested wisdom with you. Who knows? It's probably exactly what you need right now. So, let me tell you a little bit about Peter. He's the author of SA's best-selling book on surviving business closure. It's called Crash Proof Your Business. He wrote it in 2004 after closing a business in 1992 and after hundreds of offline seminars teaching small business owners what can go wrong and how to deal with it. He had a road to Damascus moment when he published the Crash Proof manuscript online the day he released it to his offline publisher. His entire business has been online since then, which must tell you something about the success of that move. First in South Africa, then England, and now Norway, Peter offers online courses for small businesses, including the original Crash Proof seminar. Peter Carruthers, Road to Damascus Moment. Sounds dramatic. What happened? It, it does, but um, I'd always wanted to go online. Um, but after closing a business and losing everything and, and all of the challenges that you bump into to restart with judgments and the like, online just seemed like a wonderful place to work. Uh, and the fact that you could get income from all over the world, magic. And I'd, I'd reached the end. I'd, I'd been working on, on offline seminars for about whew, eight years. And I was tired. I'm diabetic. And I woke up in a bedroom that wasn't my own in a hotel somewhere. I kind of, I went in, I was tired. I, low blood sugar, got the key, walked into a room, fell asleep, and woke up to discover two, two suitcases in the room that should only have one, and one of them had ladies' clothing. And, and I rushed out, got my correct key, and, and suddenly realized, you know, you get caught in a situation like that, there's just no excuse. So I, I wanted to go online kind of desperately. And I was asked to write the, the script for the seminar that I'd been running for the past eight years. As I completed it, I happened to be watching on my screen, um, sitting in this... Uh, apartment above the beach in Mshlanga Rocks, getting divorced for the second time. And I, I had this, this manuscript in this hand and I was watching the screen in the other end. And there was this site that I was looking at called Secrets to Their Success. And these guys were charging $19 a month to have access to this primitive site where they basically published two stories each month. Every two weeks, there'd be a story. And at the end of each, week, uh, end of each month, they'd send you a new password because we all had the same password. And I looked at my manuscript and I looked at this, I thought, well, I can do this. I can publish this. And that's exactly what I did. I published it into a, into a primitive kind of site where I changed the password every month. Uh, the first password, I think, was pencil. And um, I told my community, I had a whole bunch of people who'd been through seminars. I wrote to them and said, you can join. I answer, you're all small business owners. I answer the question for one of you. It answers the question for everybody else. And 50, I think 500 people joined at 100 rand a month. In the, first, in the first couple of weeks. Here's the thing. I mean, it was exciting. Don't get me wrong. This was, this was really exciting. Mm. In that first month, I earned more royalty income from that online experience, that, that first month, than the entire proceeds of a 10,000 selling book in South Africa. And then every month it got better and better and better. And then two years later, when the promotion of Access of Information came, uh, Act came out and we found a small, easy solution, that 50,000 went to about 600,000 a month. And for a while, I was actually quite rich. It was a very, very nice stuff. I've been cooked ever since. And that, and that was without all the setup costs that you actually have with a physical book. Yeah. I mean, there are some setup costs, obviously, but uh, things like the printing and um, all, all the other things that go with it, uh, you, you didn't have that. And it was kind of just a steady flow of income. You didn't have to wait for your royalty checks. You didn't have to follow them up. They just came straight into your bank account. Fantastic. Almost zero costs. Absolutely. And um, the, your royalties don't flow instantly if you write a book. Your royalties flow, and you, you'll know this, the royalties flow about six or eight months later. 
right? And, and they're low. I mean, the, the people that make the most, most money out of book sales are places like exclusive books. They're taking 30 or 40% off the top. And by the time it dribbles down to you, you're on what, 80%, that's 8% or 9% royalties. Sure. Online, online, it's all yours. I love that. So my question to you, why do you believe that online is more intimate than offline? Most people think it's the reverse. Yes. Um, I think the key challenge, we're used to offline, we're used to schools, we're used to the way it's always been done. And what we're looking at is a completely new thing. And we're trying to replicate the offline process exactly in an online process. We shouldn't, it's different. So let's, the, the question should be, what is intimate about offline? As a mm. speaker, you get up in front of a crowd, there's a whole chunk of energy coming at you, which is wonderful. Mm. But the person who's sitting in the seat has had to travel there, they arrive um, in, a, in a group, they're sort of, maybe you've got 100 people in the room, yeah. there's the intimacy. They're milling around, they're, they're, they're kind of hesitant about doing anything. Nobody wants to put up their hand to ask the first question. And in fact, if you look at the average live event, two or three people will ask all of the questions and they're guys that kind of, they want you to hear them rather than actually ask real questions. Mm. Um, you're sitting in a room which is noisy. You're either too far from the stage or you're too close to the stage. You're sitting to somebody who's coughing and he sounds like he's got coronavirus before we had coronavirus. In the next room, the Springboks are, are learning in Kozi Sikileli or, or the new South African anthem or whatever it is, but it's noisy. Mm. You're hungry because you didn't have time to have a snack on the way in. And is there intimacy in that? Could we not do better? And when you go online, here we are, I'm talking to you comfortably. I'm, I'm in one corner of the world, you're in a different corner of the world, and Lord knows where everybody is. It, distance is no longer important. Mm. So we have a situation where th this is a whole lot more intimate. You can see me a whole lot more clearly. And if I were to broadcast my screen to you, my slides would be absolutely clear. You could see exactly what we were doing, yes. which you can't do in an, in, in an offline environment. Sure. You get a recording built into the package so that at the end of the event, people can walk away with what are the best notes in the world. Sure. Wait, what's not intimate about this? I, 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 I kind of bumped into this for the first time when I, when I did some writing way back. And um, I'm a bit embarrassed to tell the story, but this is the kind of thing that would never happen in a, in a, uh, in a live webinar, in a live seminar, I should say. And it certainly would never happen in, in a consultation. Mm -hmm. Somebody, I'd written about something related to businesses going out, out of business. And this woman wrote back from Northwest Province. Um, I've never been there, so this was a surprise, this was a biggie. And she wrote back and she finished the email saying, and you know, I haven't even had sex for a year. And I thought to myself, nobody would ever say that in a seminar. And yeah. that's in, nobody would ever say that in a consultation because well, as a South African, I'd have to offer to assist with the situation, but you see the problem, <laughs> okay? And, and um, it's over here, when you, when you consult, you're so much closer to folk. They don't have to travel anywhere. Uh, you're not in a noisy situation. It's just you and that person talking about issues. And if it's a small group of people, you've got everybody's pictures on the, on the, on the screen. What's not intimate about that? People can ask questions. And probably, you, you've probably got more questions coming up now over here than you'd ever have in a live event. Have, be it about the intimacy of online or the courses that Peter offers, uh, and in particular, his niche market, which is the small business and the way he helps small businesses to not only succeed, but also to uh, protect yourselves. But you, you were saying an interesting thing, uh, Peter, about the logistics of it. And I, I know that sometimes when you're, you're in a conference, you, you might be jammed between um, a, a row on your left and a row on your right. If you need to go to the loo, it's difficult to get out without disturbing people. Very often you've got a head in front of you, so you can't see part of what you're supposed to see. And of course, if you've just got uh, a decent speaker and you've got a reasonable screen, uh, you, can, you can see everything pretty clearly. And all you really need apart from that is a, is a good connection. Which used to be, I mean, back in, back in about 2005, getting a good connection was, was challenging. You couldn't do video like you're seeing through Zoom at the moment. It was very good. Um, now, how steep? I mean, just a, a, the, the video camera on my, my PC is better than videos that were taken professionally of my last live event at the, at the, at the casino. And it, uh, it costs a whole lot less. I mean, back then, the three-hour event was 35,000 rand to, to video. That's, that's just crazy. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, let's just look at the costing element of it. 
you know, for, for one, it costs you money as a speaker to get to the event. So when we spoke earlier, you said that an online event offers so much more value than an offline event with much less cost. So what did you mean by that? Okay, so to get to an online event, uh, uh, let, let me rephrase that. Each time I put on an, online, an offline event, before I, I could make a profit, I had to recover the cost of the hotel venue. And typically that was paid about three or four months in advance. And the, the, the fees were huge, about three or 400 rand a seat. Uh, I had to recover the cost of traveling there, the cost of car rental to get to the hotel, the cost of accommodation. And on top of that, I had to make a profit. So by the mm -hmm. time we finished, you, you, you couldn't really do without a price of around about between 750 and 1,000 rand for a three hour session. Sure. Ignore all of the other challenges associated with that, but th that was my cost. Now the, 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 the um, person coming, the delegate, has to get into a car and travel, they, they've got to park their car in a hotel parking area for three or four hours. They're probably going to have dinner somewhere, somewhere close by. So their costs are up by, by quite a percentage. Sure. Total cost to the, the person who's coming is my price plus all of the other bits and pieces. Mm. Contrast that with online. We're talking through what is effectively a free mechanism at the moment, and there are a bunch of them. Yeah. But if, if I were to put up a, a uh, I use Demio at the moment, and I've used GoToWeb and on a couple of the other places, but Demio charges me $50 a month for a 50-seater venue. I can, I can put on a seminar, a webinar, every hour of every day for an entire year for mm. $50 a month, $600. Yeah. That's somewhere around about 9,000 Rand. Yes. That's about half the price of a 100-seater venue anywhere in South Africa right now. Where you're limited to just the people in that geographical environment. That, that geographic environment, number one, and the time. Your time is limited. You can only broadcast Monday through, through Thursday. or uh, no, You can only do a live event Monday through Thursday, no public holidays. Weekends mm -hmm. are reserved for a whole bunch of other things. So mm -hmm. Friday, um, Saturday, and Sunday are out. The moment a, a public holiday kicks in, we're in all sorts of trouble. The mm -hmm. moment load shedding kicks in, we're in all sorts of trouble. So your cost is so low that you can virtually give away especially because you've got volume. It's not Johannesburg anymore. It's Alisdale. It's Somerset East as opposed to Somerset West. It's the whole world can come. And um, why charge them the kind of prices you would charge for an offline environment? Very much so. But Peter, what's quite interesting is that offline, uh, sorry, online must have come as manna from heaven to you because of your diabetes. And, and some yeah. people don't realize that diabetes is, if not managed extremely carefully, is a life-threatening, it's a daily life-threatening condition um, that you have. So my question to you is, how did you manage diabetes while you were doing so much traveling and doing those offline events? With incredible difficulty. Um, I, I recall driving um, back from Port Elizabeth doing a seminar one night and it, 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 I'd finished and I'd, I decided to drive back to Neisner and it, the wind was howling down and um, I stopped at Jumansdorp and there were a couple of folk looking for a lift somewhere, an old lady and, 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 and a kid and a couple of youngsters. And so I said, get in the car and I'll drive you wherever you're going because the, the, the just miserable weather. And without realizing, as I, realizing it, I was in, a, in this kind of low blood sugar situation. I was down at probably averages about six. Um, I was probably running at about four going downwards. And I just drove faster and faster. And there's a sign which said, warning flood. And I said to the lady in it, is this a problem? She said, no, no. So we're screaming down at about 180 kilometers an hour without me realizing that I'm driving at that speed. And the, the two kids at the back say, we get off here. So they get out. And as they, and I, still, I still get this kind of ah, feeling when I, when I think about this. As they get out, I look in front of me and there's a river crossing the road. And all I could think of is, how the hell do I explain to Mrs. Carruthers that I died in a car, drowned with two other people in the car with me. I mean, how, where do you go from that? Mm. And it was at that point that I realized, you know, this is crazy. At some point, this is going to break. And, mm. you know, if you're diabetic, you probably know what it's about. If you're not diabetic, it's, uh, it sounds com completely weird. Mm. Um, yeah. And so I, I've been desperate to go online ever since. Um, and the fact that, you know, the, the, the other thing about online for me that was really amazing, if you close a business in South Africa and you pick up one tiny judgment, it's like being pregnant, okay? You, you can't be half pregnant. One judgment and you're a financial criminal. Yeah. And the moment you've got that one judgment, you cannot start a new business without getting somebody else to help you. You can't get credit cards. You can't get credit. You can't even open up a bank account. Yeah. Online, nobody cares because 
you're using services that are all online. You can be yes. bankrupt in South Africa and you can get a PayPal account and you can go and get a, an overseas payment processor if you need one. And they can handle all of the credit card stuff and you still get your money. There's no penalty for going out of business. And since the costs are so low, you don't need a whole pile of money to start up. Absolutely. So, uh, Peter, your experience was that you, you went out of business. Yes. Um, you, you went into business because you couldn't get a job because of the diabetes. Yes. Uh, you were doing pretty well. You were one of the most admired um, companies in your space um, at the time. Um, and for whatever reason, and people, you know, I think we need to understand that small companies don't go bust uh, because they're doing something wrong. They usually go bust because someone hasn't paid them. And it's usually a very big client that's paid them late and eventually they can't handle it anymore. What led you to this crusade that you've been on for the last 20 years or so to help small businesses and entrepreneurs avoid closure or be able to protect their assets if they are forced to close? In, in my case, the precipitating event was the 92 elections, or the 94 elections. By 92, uh, you may recall that we were all terrified of, of civil war. And all of our companies were, all of our clients were IBM uh, mainframe users. And they all stopped buying. They all stopped hiring staff. And everybody just stopped buying. We waited for stuff. And it's, it's a little bit like this coronavirus thing where, for whatever reason, we've all stopped buying. I mean, we're probably stacking toilet paper in the ceiling just in case it gets worse. And with that sudden drop, as I walked into this, this closure situation, the thing that occurred to me is I'd read every book on starting a business. I mean, I'm, I'm not stupid. And I'd done everything I could to do everything right. And nobody had ever, ever, ever mentioned personal sureties. Not once. It, it just, when I spoke to my accountant, it was assumed that, Everybody does this. When I spoke to a lawyer about it later, he says, everybody does this. And I'd signed these things all over the place without realizing what they were. Because the, the, despite the bank saying, you understand this, you don't. Mm -hmm. So I'd signed all of these documents, um, uh, overdrafts and cars and overseas finance and all sorts of things, landlords for, for, for rentals. And when the thing closed, when the business closed, we kind of paid back the, st the money that we owed. What we didn't understand was these, these um, long-term sureties were going to kick in. So landlords were suing us, in th were suing us, were suing me for rentals in three different places, Durban, Cape Town, and Johannesburg, for properties that I had to let go because I, I couldn't pay for them anymore. But they were suing me for the next three years rentals on these things. Where do you go from there? Because of contracts that you'd signed. Correct, correct. Yeah. And w when I went back, when I started talking to other folk about this issue of signing, the, the standards, we have to sign them. Not one book talks about this. They do talk about the fact that if you trade as a sole prop, you've got yeah. risk. Nobody talks about the risks of signing just one surety. And, and a, simple, a simple case, one of, one of my clients was 79 years old when he was sued on a surety that he'd signed when he sold his, before he sold his business when he was 60, 19 years prior to that. And these things have a life of their own after you leave your business. It's, it's horrifying. And it's the same all over the world. And so it means effectively, Peter, let, let me just understand this. What you're saying is that if you sign a surety for a business, you then sell that business to somebody else, but you don't get that surety revoked. If that guy goes bust running the business, they'll come after you for the money. Not only for the money that you left in the business or, or the, the money that was owing when he, you sold the business, but for any new loans there are subsequent to that. You've guaranteed that that firm is safe with whatever savings you have. And that's typically your house and everything else. Wow. So, so your, your, your most, let, let's say, your, your, what are your three biggest and most relevant bits of advice for small business owners in terms of protecting themselves from losing their assets after closure and sureties? What, what, what would you say? Well, one, don't sign sureties. Right. That, that really is utterly key. And I, I know there's a tremendous amount of pressure put on you to sign these things. But the typical person says, but you can't borrow money without signing sureties. In the actual, you can. If you borrow money in the name of the company, you have to sign a surety. If you borrow money in, the, in your own personal name, yes. you don't. It's you. There's no crossover. The, question, the next question is, well, yeah, but I don't need it. The company needs it. So borrow it in your own name and then rent it to the company. 
lazy man's way. Absolutely. If you're going to, sorry, continue. No, I'm just looking at the Q and A, and um, Melanie is just saying hi, Peter. So nice to see you on my screen. She's uh, said that you're looking really good. Well, I can't disagree <laughs> with that. Uh, she's got a question. She says, "I've gotten used to the. It looks like demo style. I like it because I demo style because I actually don't want to dress up for the webinar, webinars. So can one join with a voice only option? I know that with Zoom meetings, you have to have a camera. You have to be on the screen." Can you? Yeah, you can answer that better than me. D Demio, you don't. You you can go with just voice and screen, or you can go with just voice. I think you can do the same with Zoom, though, can't you? Yes, of course. So all you do is you decide as the participant whether you want your video on or not. There will be some meetings that you're in where they insist that you turn your video on for whatever reason. But you must also remember that if there are a lot of people on the screen, uh, that it's going to use up additional bandwidth and it can then affect the the quality this particular format that we're using today because we were anticipating that we could have quite a few uh, they call them registrants we did it in in webinar format which means that we can't actually see the participants the participants can only see us um but if you're doing a video conference format then you have the choice to either show your video or or, or not show it so uh, Quibus asks, he says, Pete, I know you were also very positive about online seminars and training, but not as positive about doing actual online work, like for instance, tax work, et cetera. Is that still the case? Uh, Quibus, yes and no. Sorry, I, that's a really nasty answer. Quick quest, the, the quick answer, I love selling courses because you encapsulate your knowledge. You, you, you're actually investing your time in producing something that you can sell without you being present. And this allows you, if, if you're involved in tax work, for instance, this allows you to assemble the most common pieces of information you will typically offer, assemble them into a box. And when somebody says, I need some guidance, you say, take this course and it should cover everything. But if it doesn't, I can consult with you afterwards. And in that, you've, you've sold your hour without actually investing, without actually delivering that hour. By selling that hour, they're getting a quality course, they're getting a bunch of other stuff that you would normally want to cover but can't because of the, the constraints. So they're getting three or four hours of you for the price of one hour, one hour of consultation. And if that still doesn't answer their question, you can then go and say, well, you can, I'll either give it to you as, as a freebie because um, I'll then build it into my package or you can then charge them a consulting fee to do that. The, the challenge here is the, at some point, you're going to want to stop working. And you do not want to be where you, in a situation where you're 75 and still having to consult to earn an income. Yeah. Packaging the course, you've invested the hours, they start, it's like, as, as, as you said a little bit earlier on, Paul, it's like writing a book, except mm -hmm. a book when you sell it has a certain value that you can't, you can't exceed. You can't sell a book for more than about $15 because nobody ever has, unless it's sort of that thick and it's a textbook. So a typical book, one of these sort of um, pop psychology books, won't sell for more than about $10. But a yeah. pop psychology course on virtually anything ranging from spinach diets to dying in an offline business, hmm. um, th that can be based on the value that the client is going to derive. So if, if you're going to go and lose your home, for me to sell you a course called Crash Proof Your Business for $100, wow, it's a good deal. Very much so. But Peter, th that really raises the, 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 the topic of marketing because you can have the best course in the world, but if you, if you don't have the ability to target that course, that book, your webinar, your training, whatever it is, to your customers, you're not going to get any sales. So how does, how does one do that? How did you go about doing that? In my case, I, when I started my very first business, I read a book on marketing. And it, it, it said, basically, you are going to market directly. Whatever you do, you're going to send letters. And so we had this, we were in this fairly complex field of connecting um, PCs to mainframes. And rather than try and tell people what it was that we were doing, I simply wrote stories once every two weeks to about 500 big companies in South Africa, the, the data processing manager. And the story would be, hey, we just connected a, a distant terminal to a mainframe in Cape Town for Transex Diamonds. And we connected up a um, screen and a printer for about 25,000 Rand. The, the IBM cost for the same equipment was 280,000 Rand. Their delivery time was six months. We did it in a one week. And we just told that story. And two weeks later, I tell another story. And after a while, people would start calling back saying, so you've done that. Can you do it for a 
oil rig in Muscle Bay, for instance. And within about, oh, I think, four or five years, we, we, we were speaking to every single client that IBM had in this field. And we had 80% of that data comes knowledge, uh, data comes business. It wasn't big by their standards. By our standards, it was the equivalent of about 40 million rand a, a year now. So it, it was nice business for, for a small group of people. I did exactly the same thing when I started going online. Crash proof? I built a group of people, I gathered a group of people, I should say, that were interested in surviving business closure. Yeah. And over time, a lot of them closed their businesses and they came back and said, well, how do I restart? So then we went into the whole restart process. And then they went, how do I market stuff? So we, we taught them how to market. Now, all I was doing was teaching the stuff that I knew already worked. Yes. And those that have adopted have, have been able to transition from offline to online very easily because they've got a list of people that are already their market. And in Kubis's case of here, where he's already doing tax work, he must have a group of people that are involved in t it or, or have tax issues. Start putting that into a course. Start writing emails about tax problems. You, forgive me, but you give the problem away for free, mm. and ask you for the solution, you sell them a solution. Yes. So once again, it goes down to identifying a problem, identifying the market that has the problem and giving them options in terms of how they can um, solve the problem and making sure that your one is the most attractive option. Not necessarily the most attractive. Um, can I just, I don't see it as a market. I see it as people. Um, oh, cool. Um, so the, you know, they talk about you've got to have an avatar. Um, I think I know who the avatar is because I talk to these guys every day. So I kind of know who they are. So if you know who you're talking to, it's much, much easier to sell. So that's number one. Number two, um, when you give away the problem, you, you don't actually have to really market. You simply, you're writing a story about a problem somebody has uh, and you're looking for this to identify, if, looking for everybody else that's reading you to identify with that problem. And when they come back, if enough of them come back with the same question, hmm. you've got the beginning of a course because yes. you answer that one question and from that, you'll get three or four with, with slightly different variants. But you answer those questions, and before you know it, you've got a course. And the average speaker that I know typically should have a course, at least one course inside him uh, before starting. So your analogy of it not being a market, it being people, is for a speaker uh, very much like saying, you don't talk to an audience because I'm not an audience. I'm a person. So I want the speaker to speak to me individually yeah. And this is, in a sense, what makes online so intimate because the speaker is looking or the person that's holding the webinar is looking directly at you and they're speaking to you directly. They're speaking to you. They're speaking to your needs. And there is that feeling of ultimately of intimacy. I think it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, one of the biggest challenges I bump into with most of my clients is they arrive on board and everybody wants to be a zillionaire next week. Hmm. And scarcity economics, which is the way you and I used to work in terms of um, you're going to Johannesburg, you have to find 50 people to fill a room because you've paid for 50 seats and you miss one or somebody doesn't pitch, it costs money. Over here, you can create an event for 50 people, but you can have two in every country in the world to get yeah. to your 50 in, in, without having to be in a specific, so it doesn't matter how unique or how niche your, your concept, your product, your, your information, your knowledge is, you can find, here's, here's a quick number for you, one in a million, which is a, which is a very tiny percentage of the population, one in a million, given the 4.5 thousand million people that are online, one in a million means you've already got an audience of 4,500 people. And that's just a staggering figure because 4,500 yeah. people is the audience that I've had for the past 20 years. And that's brought in, um, it's, it's brought in more than a million rand every year since I, I, I started back in 2004. Wow. And one can kind of live off that if you have to. You, you can. Uh, 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 Kevin Kelly, I think it was, wrote a wonderful article way back in about 2007. And he basically spoke about the fact that $100,000, you can live off it anywhere in the world. And his concept was if you can find 1,000 people prepared to give you $100 each year, that's $100,000. Mm. You could live anywhere. And even in Norway, which is the most expensive place on earth right now, mm. you can live very comfortably on what, it, what would be, in fact, $100,000 would put you into the top 1% of Norwegian income. Wow. Right. Okay, so we've just got past the half hour mark, and there might be those that need to leave us before we've finished yakking. So, Peter, I'm going to ask you just to talk to us about your little special that you are in fact, I think it's a giveaway. 
I'm going to put it in the chat box. Let's make sure that I send it to everybody. Uh, <laughs> there it is. Do you want to just chat us about that? Okay. So when I, when I started, um, when I closed, I was completely lost and just utterly, utterly embarrassed that this could happen. Mm. I began speaking to a whole bunch of other small business owners to try and find out what they had done that I hadn't done. I mean, what were they doing that kept them in business? And um, Michael Gerber had just published a book on, uh, called The E-Myth Revisited, and he spoke about these traumatic failure rates. Mm. And as I began to speak to other business owners, uh, I, I eventually spoke to about 150. I said, I was, I was trying to sell them insurance at the time. So I, I, I visited and spoke for about an hour with about 150 people each. And as I spoke to them, and I, the, I, I kind of gleaned little bits of things that they were doing. One, one guy said, well, I've got a trust. And I said, well, what the hell is that? And he explained. And another person said, I put some stuff in my wife's name. And over time, th th there were a couple of things that came came to the fore, but most folk had no clue about the fact that when they go to business, and when I said, you've signed a surety, haven't you? And he said, no. I said, you've got an overdraft. Yeah, you've signed a surety. This is what that means. And it was this kind of horror. Yeah. And um, the problem with, I then began consulting with these folk because they started phoning me and saying, hey, Pete, you spoke to me six months ago about going out of business. I'm now going out of business. What do I do? And I'd, I'd give him some ideas. And the problem with that kind of consulting is by the time they're there, they can't afford to pay you. Yeah. So that, that's a really bad, a bad business in the first place. And I was, I was, in essence, consulting for free. And nobody listened because it was free. So there was, there was no reason to take any action. So I began a, I, I, I assembled a seminar and I thought, well, let me just put it all in a box. And I, I started presenting this. Uh, and it was great. My first seminar was in Somerset West, November um, 2000. Uh, November 95, I gave everybody a, a, a shot of um, sherry before we started because that was very gesellig. And they were all asleep by 8 o'clock, which was great. Um, didn't do that again. But because of the sherry or because of what you were saying? I, I think it was because of what I was saying. <laughs> I think the sherry kept them awake just until that point. And um, no, but after that, um, it just it, it grew legs. And uh, I, I remember being invited to talk to Asata in Mauritius once. And as I outlined the sort of challenges that these small business owners face, there were a couple of bankers in the audience. Mm. Uh, they were working with the, the various credit card companies and both came up to me afterwards, or separately, they came up to me afterwards and said, the other banks do that? We don't do that? Mm. They did, but that's not the point. And so that course was, I, I recorded a version of that course in 98. And the, the, when I was looking at this whole online thing. I, I, I'd arrived in Norway and um, I, I found this old video that I had that I'd recorded. And I thought to myself, you know, rather than rebuild all this material from scratch, let me just see if there's a, a market for it right now. And I took that and I, I had it converted into, into MP4 and I cut the MP4 bits up into different pieces. And that's the, that's the live, well, it's the, the event from 98. And if anybody's on it, they'll get the upgraded version when I upgrade it because the video is, it's very 98-ish. Yeah. Yeah. But anybody who's on that course, I think there are probably about 1,200 or 1,300 people that have, that, that, have, that have either purchased or they're on the free version, which is there because of coronavirus, because frankly, I don't think many of us are going to survive this. Um, the, the, the material's current. It's just me that's not. I just I look so much younger. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm so young that I'm a bit embarrassed looking at myself. I'm going to put a, I'm going to, when I redo it, I'm going to leave me in the bottom corner, the, 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 the young me in the bottom corner, and every now and then the old me is going to pop up at the top corner and say, so what the young Pete was saying there, well, let's talk about what it is now. Young Pete. <laughs> young Pete. That's it. Can I, uh, can I just possibly answer Quibus's question, if, if you don't mind? Yes. But a second. Quibus says, yes, but not everybody can give training. Some must do the work. This is in the, the context of the question he asked earlier about um, he doesn't really want to. Um, he's a little concerned about online seminars and things like that. Um, Quibus, yes, somebody has to do the work. But my simple question is, when you get into 65, there's a lot of people who want to do the work. You don't have to do it. If you exactly. invest your time in a course, you will make as much money, if not more than them, without having to do the work but offering exactly the same value. In fact, probably a lot more value because you're spreading your, you might take a hundred hours to create a course, but you're selling that a thousand times. That's if, uh, effectively the, the, you're getting a whole pile more money back for the work that you've done. And that work can then last three, four, five, ten 10 years into your retirement. So very much so. So the thinking that if, you, if you're doing training, you have to live in Johannesburg or Cape Town 
is flawed because if you want to go and live in Hermanus or Nisna or anywhere like that, you can simply get other facilitators. And the reality is that people that can really write good material is fairly limited, but there are a lot of facilitators out there that can really facilitate training very well. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, um, some of the work I do, there's, there are a lot of things I won't touch. So I'm quite happy to sell other people's courses. And, and there's a mechanism called affiliates, uh, affiliate schemes that allows you to do that and take a commission for it. So um, if a group of people gather together and they're in the same genre, if Quibus goes and starts producing a series of tax courses, I'm happy to sell them because I'm never going to do that. Mm. But it's related to the challenges my clients face. That sure. just makes sense. So you want to make sure that you're not sending stuff to your people that has absolutely no bearing on them whatsoever. Right. Correct. Yeah. Fantastic. Peter, thank you so much. Um, I just want you to explain to folk quickly what they need to do in terms of accessing the course, the websites there, it's free. Do they just simply go in and use it? I'm happy to give this away for free to anybody that can use it. Wow. That's very generous. It's, uh, it's an incredibly painful thing to lose everything. So, uh, yeah. Literally.crashproof2020. Okay, so that's that's the same one that I put up a little bit earlier. Correct. So yeah. Okay, so that, so that's free. To click on that, and then they need to register for the course. Yes, um, it's an email address and a password. That's it. Great stuff. So for everyone that has joined us uh, today, I'd like to just firstly thank you for, for for joining us. I'd like to thank Peter very much for sharing his wisdom and information with us. And to the folk that are going to be watching the recording, and I'm sure that there are going to be quite a few of you, um, welcome to you. Sorry you couldn't join us today. Uh, we had about a 50% participation from those that registered. Um, and I think the person that registered from New Zealand probably didn't realize that it would be um, in the middle of the night for them. So that's, that's Walter. Hello, Walter. <laughs> yeah, hi, Walter. So Walter can come back and listen to the recording. And uh, Peter, if you can just share that with your people and uh, then they can come back and they can hear what we've, we've been talking about. So everyone, thank you for joining us. Peter, thank you very much. I believe you've got one more webinar to attend to before you can hit the sack today. So uh, bless you all and um, stay safe. Thanks, Paul. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh,